Well, it is a real privilege and honor to be able to introduce the next speaker, who is truly a champion for our values. He's someone who has stood up time and time again in defense of the truth about marriage, in defense of the truth about the nature of human life and human dignity, and he's someone that many of us have looked up to for a long time. Now, there are some, as many of you know, within the Republican Party that think it would be a good idea to take the three legs of the stool, social conservatives, economic conservatives, foreign policy conservatives, take the three legs and just get rid of that social conservative leg, just maybe lop it off a little bit. But those of us in, the, in this room know that that is the exact way that we've been losing elections, not winning them. The simple truth is that you cannot blame social conservatives for lost elections when you spent over one billion dollars and in almost no ads did you mention marriage or life. It's not our fault. Instead, when we have leaders who boldly stand for the party platform, who boldly stand for the truth that marriage is the union of a man and a woman, for the truth that life begins at conception. Voters can trust them because they're standing up and talking about what they believe in. The reality is that if someone will betray the core truth about our values on marriage and life, then why would they not betray our values in foreign policy or in the economic realm? They all go together. And our next speaker has stood up, and we know him as someone who has stood up on our values here at home. But he's also stood up on economic freedom, and most importantly, in foreign policy. Senator Rick Santorum, before all of us were talking about that Syria and Iran were, were what, what we heard every day in the news and were chatting about them, back in 2003, authored and moved through Congress the Syrian Accountability Act to hold terrorists accountable. The Iran Freedom and Support Act in 2005 to encourage democracy in Iran and again to hold the folks that would do damage to our country accountable. He was a bold leader, a visionary leader who realized that to be a conservative is to stand with all three legs of that stool. It is my privilege and honor to give you former presidential candidate and U.S. Senator Rick Santorum. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brian. Thank you for the great work that you do at the National Organization for Marriage. Uh, and thank all of you for being here. Uh, this is my ninth speech uh, here at the Value uh, Voters Summit. Uh, it's because there's only been nine Value Voters Summits. <laughs> I told Tony backstage that I expect a pin next year, like an attendance pin for 10 years. Uh, but I come here because, as Brian said, we together have been out there fighting the battles on these fronts. We've been, uh, we've been successful in many respects, much more than certainly anyone expected on some issues, uh, particularly on the life issue, which you're really turning to see some dramatic and dynamic changes of America coming to the realization of the dignity of all human life. I can tell you for me personally, obviously that's a very uh, important issue for me. Uh, one that uh, was not just one that I've been out there speaking about for a long time and taking podiums, uh, but have been living. Uh, I want to give you regards from Karen and our seven children. Uh, and particularly, I want to give you regards from our little girl, Bella, who, uh, through the grace of God, through your prayers, uh, is now uh, six and a half years old. And we are... You know, I've, I've taken these podiums, thousands of them, literally thousands of them, to talk about life. 
Uh, but through Bella, God has given Karen and I a gift of not just talking about life, but living a, an example of the blessings and, frankly, the crosses that come with the acceptance of the dignity of all human life. Uh, it is a wonderful opportunity that I have to witness to that. And, in fact, Karen and I have uh, just finished a book uh, that will be coming out in February uh, that will be a, a very raw witness as to the life in a family, uh, a somewhat high-profile family, with a special needs little girl. And uh, the name of the book, which I hope you will uh, have the opportunity to see, is uh, Bella's Gift. And so uh, I'm very excited about that uh, in sharing the, the reality of accepting life uh, in, in all of its forms and, and respecting it for, for what it is and what it can be. We've been out here fighting the battle now as a Value Voter Summit for nine years. And I think we all realize and have heard speeches over these last nine years and for many years before about the real clash that's going on, the clash of worldviews. I like to talk about it in terms of the difference between the American Revolution and the French Revolution. The American Revolution of which we descend is one that believes in God-given rights, the dignity of all human life, and that rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness that is the foundational principles upon which America stands and made us the most prosperous, free nation in the history of the world. And that there's others in Western civilization who descended from another revolution that was a secular revolution, anti-clerical revolution that believed in rights being given to you by the state. We replaced the king, the sovereign king, with the sovereign state. And that the state is the one that gives us rights. And ladies and gentlemen, that clash is front and center in America today. And we're seeing it like we've never seen it today. You just heard from Kelly Shackelford and the assault on religious liberty in America, unprecedented, but not unexpected. You see, if you understand and if you look at the world through clear eyes, not through rose-colored glasses or through some contorted view, but you look at the real struggle that is taking place in America today, it is very easy to see where we are going. Many people have criticized me in the past for going out in front on some issues saying, oh, this will never be a problem in America. When I forced in 2004 and then again in 2006 in the United States Senate, something that everyone said is premature. Why are you even talking about this? This will never be an issue in America. Go back and read the debate. What was it on? A federal marriage amendment. This will never be an issue. You, we, this can't possibly happen here. If you look clearly through the prism of the struggle that is at hand, it is easy to see why I introduced the Workplace Religious Freedom Act 12 years ago to protect the very people that we now are seeing in court cases like Hobby Lobby. It's easy to see where we are going if you know what the fight is. And that's why it's important, ladies and gentlemen, to elect leaders and to have leaders within our movement, which we, frankly, do not have many of, particularly in the Republican establishment, who understand the existential struggle that is in America today. And then are prepared to engage that struggle because when we lose these battles, when we lose these precious freedoms that I talk about, then everything else will start to fall because now government has gotten more intrusive and bigger and dictatorial, and the secular status to control government are the ones who will be dictating not just how you practice a religion, but how you run your business, who you do business with, and how. Economic freedom is set certain to go, as is everything else. So ladies and gentlemen, we know very well that this class of civilizations, if you will, is very present in America today. And so when I heard the President say at the United Nations that there is no clash of civilizations at stake here, and this is all hogwash, this is all tripe from those who don't see the world the way he sees the world, I would suggest to you that it's because he sees the world as a descendant of the French Revolution and doesn't quite see the lines as someone who understands the dignity of all human life and the protection of liberty and the freedom of conscience. 
and a world, a very fundamentally different world, not of Western civilization, that sees God and sees people differently, fund out, found, fundamentally different than we do here. So yes, there is a very big clash going on right now in the Middle East against a civilization that for 1,300 years, given a respite of a couple hundred years, has been in conflict with our civilization. Those who ignore history are destined to repeat it. And unless we have clear-minded leaders who can look at that clash and look into the future and say, here's where we're going. Here's what's, here's what's next because I've seen this before. Back in 2004, 2003, as, Kelly, as, uh, as uh, Brian mentioned, I introduced the Syrian Accountability Act the Iran Freedom and Support Act. Why? Because I said back then that Iran is pursuing a nuclear weapon and the administration, this time the Bush administration. So, no, no, no. But if you understand Shia Islam and the leaders of Iran and you hear what they say, not just to the Western press, but to their own people, then it's very easy to see the path that they're on, the decisions that they will make. And they will be to arm and have the ability to project power with nuclear weapons. There's no doubt that's what they're doing. There's no doubt that that's their path. And yet, we have a president who is in Disneyland. He is looking through at these issues and seeing a country developing advanced uranium refinement, producing weapons, excuse me, producing rockets to fire weapons. The only weapons that they were used to fire are nuclear weapons throughout Asia and beyond. And a program up until recently, they're saying now they've suspended it, that was to weaponize this nuclear material. And we still are in doubt as to whether they want to pursue a nuclear weapon or not. Ladies and gentlemen, when I fought President Bush back in 2005 and 2006 about defining this war to the American public, about explaining to the American public what is at stake and who the enemy is, I did so because I believe then, as I believe now, that this is an existential fight. It has been for a long time. Radical Islam in form, one form or another has been around for a long time and its borders are very bloody. Ladies and gentlemen, we don't have borders anymore when it comes to the technology that's available for those who want to do harm. We have all sorts of means to project power, to project, project fear, to terrorize, whether it's a simple film clip of a beheading or a bomb going off in an unexpected place. There are no borders that protect us. And the borders we have are not secure to protect us. We need leaders and we need to be a movement that is sure, that is not divided. We see so much division within the Republican ranks, the conservative ranks about the direction to take on all of these issues, on all these clashes, the clash of civilizations here, where as you heard Brian talk about the Republican establishment saying, no, no, we need to stop talking about these things. I don't know about you, but I have never been involved in a race in where you play defense on an issue and you put points on the board. But that's what we've decided to do as an establishment Republican Party is to simply play defense, to ignore these, to put our heads in the sand and, and hope that these issues go away. When in fact, the, by every survey that's ever been done, the folks who have extreme positions on these issues are our opponents. And yet, we refuse, as Brian said, a billion dollars in advertising and not a single mention of these issues. 
And the same is true when it comes to the issues overseas. Ladies and gentlemen, I know there are people who think that America should just pack up and and pay attention to our own problems and ignore the problems around the world and that somehow this is constitutionally provided for. Our Constitution provides for limited government. It doesn't necessarily provide for uniform, small government. In fact, there are areas in which our government should be quite robust, but limited to certain areas where government is in fact the only, the only place where this responsibility lies. And that, of course, is national defense. So don't confuse small and limited. Sometimes limited means limited to certain subject areas, but robust in those areas to protect our freedoms and keep us secure. And that is what I argue for, and that's what we as Republicans have always argued for. It's the three legs of the stool, understanding how they all weave together to protect our liberty limited government to do the things that are essential that government can do, providing for common defense, and small government when it comes to areas which impose upon our freedoms, particularly on our religious liberty and our businesses. So people always ask me, okay, Rick, if that's the game plan, if that's the struggle that we're in, what do I do? I hear this all the time. What do I do? I'm only one person. What well, do you realize that if you look at the last 40 years of the United States, and you look at survey after survey of people who consider themselves traditional values conservatives and progressive values liberals, there's twice as many conservative traditional values people in this country than there are liberals, yet for the past 30 or 40 years we've been losing ground. How does that happen? It happens because they're willing to fight, because they're willing to sacrifice, because they're willing not to give up. If you look at the current conservative movement, Republican Party, there are issues that we, aren't even, we haven't even lost yet, and we're talking about giving up. We're not even willing to fight the fight, to stand for what we say we believe in. Because we think, well, history is moving in a different way. History? We are the determiners of history. Not history is the determinant of history. We are not to look to history, this amorphous concept to judge us. We have somebody else that we need to pay attention to when it comes to judging us. And it's not history. So why do we lose? It's because we don't have enough Brian Browns and Kelly Shackelfords and many of you out here in the audience who are willing to stand up and not take no, to come back and fight. I always say we won the American Revolution not because we had the most powerful army, not because we had the most weapons, not because we had the best generals, not because of any of those things. We won because of that last line of the Declaration of Independence. We mutually pledged to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. If we are going to win this fight here at home to protect our religious liberty, to protect the right to life, to protect the institution, the glue that holds the family together, marriage, to protect our economic liberties, then we have to be willing to make those sacrifices. We have to be willing to join together and make a difference. When I left the campaign in 2012, in April, I went out and formed an organization called Patriot Voices. And I formed that organization for one reason, to provide an avenue for people to get involved and try to make a difference. Because ultimately that difference is made at the ballot box, but it's also made in the state legislatures and in the Congress and in the courts. And we have to fight them all. But we also have to fight within the family. How many of your children have the same values that you do? How many of you have seen that slip away in your own family? How can we let that happen and still hope for a good 
and healthy America? How many of you have let your schools? Do you know the most popular history textbook in schools today is written by a Marxist anti-American by the name of Howard Zinn? Is that being taught in your schools? Do you know? What are we doing to protect our children in our own classrooms? Let me assure you, they're fighting. They're fighting in schools. They're fighting in your home. They're fighting in Hollywood. Brian and Kelly are in a film. Actually, Kelly is. Brian's not. But Kelly's in a film I recently did called One Generation Away, which talks about how we're losing our religious liberty in America. I'm fighting. I'm fighting in my business. I'm fighting within my house. I'm fighting by the schools. And unless we all do that like they do, then the chance of America coming out on top as we've seen in the last 30 or 40 years, is not good. What do we do? The answer to that, something. Do something. Now you're here, and I know I'm talking to the choir in many respects, but all you in the choir have an obligation and a responsibility to go out and sing solos in your own community, in your own family, and yes, in your own business. How is it that business has gone from a place of traditional values? to a place now that has codes of conduct and education in major corporations that if you don't share these values, you have to go in for re-education about those values. How did that happen? We let it happen. How did the Bible get pushed out of schools? We let it happen. You can say, well, it was the court. It was us. The court rules against them too. They come back and fight. If we are serious, I know I talk to a lot of people and they tell me, Rick, you know, I'm really worried. I'm scared about the future of our country. I'm scared about what, what's happening here. I see things falling apart. Quit being scared and start being activists and making things happen in America. The first part of doing that is to elect leaders who are clear-minded, who have experience, and who have looked at these problems for a long time and have come down on the right side. And I'm talking about leaders of our party, leaders of our movement, and yes, leaders of our government. I know there's always a rush to, to say, oh, the new, the, the, the great, bling, and beautiful. But it is important to see how rooted these leaders are. Because I know we all have all been fooled by many who come here to Washington to be the new great leaders and turn out to be just very high profile followers. We need leaders and you need to hold them accountable. You need to understand where they are and you understand where they're going by understanding where they've been. Ladies and gentlemen, we have an opportunity in this election to do something, to get excited and to win a, not just the House back but the Senate and do it in a big margin. Let me assure you, if we don't, if we don't, we have two years from now of the 34 Senate seats up, 24 are held by Republicans. The chance of us picking up seats in 2016 are pretty close to zero. So we either go all out this time for the people that we we know are going to be with us. And I mean, go all out, even in places where it may not look possible. This could be a year where you just never know who could win. Put the effort in people that you trust. And do it again in 2016 in the primaries for all of the races that you're going to be dealing with. Go and make sure that you get behind people that have the track record and the energy and the enthusiasm to fight this battle up here in Washington, D.C. We desperately need it. Thank you all very much, and God bless you.